Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. Candace, alcoholic. So how funny. I was just like hollering at someone, and it's like, and I'm the spiritual speaker. I love that. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, we stay sober no matter what, right? I, uh, anyway, thank you guys for showing up this morning, and uh, thanks to my friend Annette who asked. So uh, Cindy was supposed to be here, and uh, Cindy's a really good friend. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on with the airlines right now, and so she wasn't able to work it out. But Cindy and I are speaking in Ohio together, so I will take all of your love, and I will give it to her. I will hold a little bit for myself, and then I'll give some to her. So uh, welcome to our new friends. Uh, My sobriety date is August 16th, 1995. It's the only date I've ever had, and that is because over the years I've remained willing to surrender behaviors and beliefs that would prevent me from staying here continuously. Do you understand? So it's not 27 years of of not losing my mind. It's not 27 years of not sleeping with the wrong person. It's not 27 years of sound financial decisions. It's 27 years of no matter what, I don't take anything that affects me from my neck up. No matter what, I don't give my seat up in Alcoholics Anonymous. Do you understand? I'm a hope to die alcoholic without the principles, without the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, and so I am typically Saturday night, but I can roll with Sunday morning. I can pull out some spirituality, right? And so so I wasn't here for the weekend because um, although I did get enough advance notice, I was already committed. So in addition to being of service in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm also of service, period, in my community. And one of my, my places is Covenant House. And so Covenant House is a shelter for homeless and trafficked youth, ages 18 to 24. And uh, I was committed to volunteer at an event there, and that commitment came before I was asked to do this. And so I said, I can come, but it'll be after covenant. So when I came in last night, like face oily, you know what I mean? I've been getting bitten by, like assaulted by mosquitoes. And, and it was amazing. There was this church there. They did a potluck and there was this like other organization who goes to different countries and they had all these things for the youth and anyone, anyone who walked by, they fed them. And that's what I'm talking about. You know, you'll hear different uh, members of Alcoholics Anonymous and some of them have religious affiliations. I don't. I I grew up with it, and it's not for me. I have a relationship with a power greater than myself that worked for me. But I'll tell you what spoke volumes about the church. They were so kind to the youth yesterday, and they were so kind to anyone who came up who wanted a plate of food. That's what I'm looking at, right? So I'm going to share some things this morning. I'm going to read a couple of things from the book. I'm probably going to quote some things from the book because I stay in the book. Right. But more than that is how am I treating you when I leave the meeting? You know what I mean? When I walk in the house by my baby, Sasha and Bianca, my cat, shout out, you know, are they are they at the door? Are they hiding under the bed? Mom's home. Right. And so um, so by the time I came here and my buddy um, Kimberly, you know, (laughs) Kimberly drove. uh because the car stuff is just real right now, and I had to take a break. I had to pause. I'm in pause, right? And so she drove. And, uh, you know, so just all of that was going on, and I wanted to get here in time for Leslie, who clearly couldn't be bothered to show up, so I will call her immediately after this is done with a huge resentment, but I don't believe in keeping it to myself. I'll be like, hey, so where were you? Uh, <laughs> so uh, we've all known each other for a long time, and uh, so it's all good. You know, when I got sober, the look was different than it is right now, right? So I got sober. I was 96 pounds. We all know I'm not 96 right now. I don't need to go into specifics. And uh, so what would happen is I would drink and enhance my drinking with just a couple of things that kept me up for eight, nine days at a time. And uh, I was hyper-focused, if you will. <laughs> a nutritious meal for me would be a candy bar V uh, three or four days, more like an energy bar. And um, and I was ball headed. And so the statement is not as dramatic now that I have 
cut my hair short because I'm in menopause and I had to. But, um, you know, when I got sober, it wasn't a cute cut from a high-end salon. It was uh, me being up for days and drinking and things like there would be movement, movement, movement. And it was distracting, distracting, distracting. And, um, and so I remember telling my friend, and by friend, I mean someone I had just met but felt super close to. And, <laughs> and I was like, something's in my hair. She was alarmed. She leaned back. She was like, how do you know? And I said, while we were talking, they ran from this side to that side. <laughs> so she, right, puts her serious friend cap uh, on, and she leans in. That's when you know it's going to be serious, when they lean in. And in her drunken, infinite wisdom, she said, you know, rubbing alcohol will sterilize anything. I love when they just drop a bomb, you know what I mean, and then sit back. And so I was like, yeah. So uh, I got a bottle of rubbing alcohol because, I mean, clearly my wise friend, you know, told me this was outlined a solution, a program of action. And, and so I got the bottle of rubbing alcohol. And then, I mean, this is like, this is, a, what's your name? Pamela. Pamela. This is so amazing. I took a group conscience. I wasn't even in AA. I didn't even know, but I set them all down. That's a group conscious. We came together. And so I was like, I know you're up there. You can stay, but I'm going to sterilize you, you know? And so I would pour rubbing alcohol all over my hair. And in the beginning, it was very soothing. It was as if I were running on a beach, only not. And uh, after a while, they began to get immune and so they got aggressive and I got aggressive and I took a pair of scissors I cut off all of my hair and then I took a shaver and I shaved it to the scalp because thoroughness is what we're talking about this weekend <laughs> we will know peace and we will be thorough and so uh, I shaved it to the scalp uh, with, a, with, a, with a shaver and so then I would wear t-shirts on my head as if they were you know a fashionable turban making my own statement and so that is the condition I came in. And one last detail, it's small. It, it doesn't even really bear mentioning, but I was missing my front tooth <laughs> when I came in. <laughs> so if you want what we have, right? And, uh, and how do we get there? Do you know what I mean? How do we get there? Because it didn't start off like that. I loved alcohol. There is no way that something I love and I'm so devoted to, so committed to, could do that to me. And that's when you start to look at what an abusive relationship is, right? I didn't get sober because I came to you 96 pounds, bald-headed and toothless. I got sober because I couldn't take it anymore. I got sober because it just hurt and I just couldn't do it, not one second longer. And when I got sober, I didn't think I was gonna stay sober. I didn't come here to stay here. That's why we don't care how you feel about it. We don't care what your motives are. We just train your feet. They told me to train my feet and shut my mouth. And it was the best thing they ever told me. Why do you keep raising your hand to share in meetings? We already know what it used to be like. Stay quiet for a little bit so you can learn how to implement some tools. Do you know what I mean? I need to load something. When I got sober... You know, I was, I was cursing all the time, and they said, we already know you know how to curse. We're going to ask you to do something different. Thank you for asking me to do something different. I was at 28 years old when I got sober. I'm 55 now. I looked older then than I do now. Ooh, Leslie. Ah! <laughs> Wait a minute. Because I don't want them saying I was talking behind your back. I'm going to tell you what I said. <laughs> I said, look, look at her pointing at Ralph. No, we take responsibility for our own lives here, Leslie. <laughs> I was all like giving you these amazing shout outs. And I'm like, it's okay that she couldn't be bothered to show up this morning. I'm going to call her. I said, I'm going to call her the minute I leave. That's all right. But. Hey, Leslie. <laughs> hey, Ralph. <laughs> All right. We are now friends again. Okay, so I said I wasn't going to be bitter, but I was lying. And so uh, anyway, you know, so I get sober at 28 years old, and I feel used up. I look shriveled up. 
in a relationship with something that I'm in love with. And so when the big book says that I'm unwilling to admit, admit what? That I can't stay in this relationship. I'm unwilling to admit that it's not working. I'm unwilling to admit that it's, it is taking me to a place I'm not packed for. And so 27 years sober, unbroken, when I sponsor women who come to me with time and we go through the book, I'm not talking to them about their drinking because they haven't drank in 16 years. They haven't drank in 11 years. They haven't drank in 19 years. We are now talking about their sober behavior, and we go page by page, paragraph by paragraph, line by line, and so we allow the words to come off the page. I was in a meeting the other night. You can't just... You can't just listen to everything. You have to have your own experience. I'm going to share my experience. It doesn't mean that you have to take it as law. Have your experience. There was a a person taking a cake, and he's been in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And so he said, I got this new sponsor. And the new sponsor says, you know, I'm not going to tell you to do all them steps, and I'm not going to tell you to get the book and all that. You already did that. And it didn't work. It's like, what? (laughs) And so I just thought, that's crazy. That's dangerous to say that to someone. And so the guy, when he was sharing about it, he says, you know, I, because I was highlighting and crossing out words, this is more than highlighting. I want you to go through the process, but then I want you to incorporate the action steps that, that the program is Alcoholics Anonymous. The program is the book. The program is not my conversation. Meetings are not the program. Meetings are where we get together so we can demonstrate how we apply the principles outlined in the book. Alcoholics Anonymous is the book. Period. And so who thought that I was going to be able to stay? Who thought that I would want to stay? Uh, You know how it's not working, but you're like, I'm not going to get sober. That's no fun. But being toothless is. (laughs) Talk about that, right? So I was thinking about the promises, and uh, so I asked for the book. I'm a little lightheaded here. It's been happening for a while now. We're going to look at that. If I drop, catch me. (laughs) Or you will be another person on my list. Okay? She's like, I'm ready. (laughs) She came off. You were on. No, okay. So... um, So let me just read this to you for a minute. I am going to share my story, but let me read this to you. So on page 52, on page 52, it says, I'm going to read it in first person because I'm talking about my life, right? I was having trouble with personal relationships. I couldn't control my emotional natures, my nature. I was a prey to misery and depression. I couldn't make a living. I had a feeling of uselessness. I was full of fear. I was unhappy. I couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. Right? Those are the bedevilments. What that is, is manifestations of self. That is untreated alcoholism. This is before I take an inventory. This is before I understand that I have to train my feet, shut my mouth, and look for ways to be of maximum service. So in order for me to successfully take the second step, I have to do the remaining steps. And the reason I share that with you is because of how it's laid out in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. We agnostics is not where step two ends. Step two ends on page 60. By the time we get to page 60, we've read the portion of how it works that you just heard. And in how it works, it goes through all 12 steps. And then it ends with God could and would if he were sought. So in order for me to be fully restored to sanity, I have to be willing to take the remaining steps, right? Because I come in, step one is I'm powerless. Why? Because I am God in step one. I'm my plan A and I'm my plan B. We're going to work it out. This is not working. Give me a minute. Let me go back to the drawing board. Not let me ask for help. You read Bill's story, he says, renewing my resolve, I tried again, not I surrendered. And so he got drunk again. I stayed sober when I stopped trying to figure it out. And when I asked you, can you help me save my life? I didn't trust you because I didn't trust me. My friends have failed me, past lovers have failed me. 
Alcoholics Anonymous has never failed me. In 27 years, it has never failed me, right? And so when I read the bedevilments, I understand because self is abound. So I go now to page 83. It says, if I'm painstaking about this phase of my development, I'm going to be amazed before I'm halfway through. I will know a new freedom. Freedom from what? The bondage of self. The bondage of, of others' opinions. The bondage from being concerned with how I look rather than how I'm living. You know what I'm talking about. A new freedom and a new happiness. So my happiness doesn't come from how much money I have. My happiness doesn't come from who I'm sleeping with. Not that it's not a little joyful. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Sunday morning. Whoops. Okay, that's weird. Thank you, Dad. That's spiritual. Yes, it is. <laughs> But wait a minute, wait for it, wait for it. I will not regret my past, nor wish to shut the door on it. Are you kidding me? I mean, that statement makes me want to leave the podium, take a seat, and listen to someone else because that is so deep. Of course I regret my past. How can I be 28 years, almost 30 years old, bald-headed, toothless, 96 pounds, coming straight off the street? You obviously know I wasn't in corporate America working for a Fortune 100 company, let alone 500 company. There was no fortune, right? (laughs) I will comprehend the word serenity, and I will know peace. Whoa. What is peace? It means being comfortable in my own skin. Yes. Serenity is just being where I am and wanting to be there. Because I live in a, over there. When I get over there, it's going to be okay. And then I get over there and I'm like, I could have sworn this was it. <laughs> Let me look at the directions again. No matter how far down the scale I have gone, I will see how my experience can benefit others. So quick story, I went through a rehab. A rehab is not Alcoholics Anonymous on any day. It is a business all day and every day. And the rehab I went through, I am grateful for because it took me off the streets and they were safe and there was running hot water. I felt fancy. What you do? I took a shower. Didn't have not one meal, but three in a day. What? And slept on a bed. A bed? What? Do you know what I mean? Because we start taking things for granted. It wasn't like that when I got sober. And so I, uh, I think I was, in reality, I was probably like 38 days sober, but this woman had come into rehab, and there was this, this um, counselor. Her name was Letty. She's passed on now. Letty was evil. And so Letty... <laughs> She was. I mean, she was amazing, but she was evil. And so uh, she said, Candace, Candace, go over there and talk to that new woman. And I was like, I don't know her. I don't have anything to give her. And her head spun around. Like those of you who are older, the, the movie The Exorcist spun around. And she was like, what? <laughs> If you're 15 days sober, you go over there and you tell her how you have managed to stay sober for 15 days. And so I remember sitting there, you know, and I had to process it. And then I started thinking about it. (sighs) I was like, yeah. Let me go over there and tell her. (laughs) Right? And so here's the beauty of it. So I go over, the thing about it is we come into Alcoholics Anonymous, and you know, it's a rehab, it's all women, and that's its own thing, right? And so she was there, you know, like tough, but she's like this long sober. And so I sat down next to her and I said, let me tell you how I've been doing it for 15 days, right? (laughs) Let me tell you. And I was like, and Letty's a trip, but it's okay. And I'm like, but the food's good here, you know? 
And so, and so it's in hindsight that we see everything. Her shoulders came down. Her shoulders came down. She didn't know anyone else, but she knew me. And I was on her side. And so when I walked away, she didn't stay. I don't know if she was there for like a couple of weeks. I know that she didn't stay. But I know that when I got up and walked away from the table, I felt different. I didn't know what it was. I felt taller. That's In hindsight, I felt taller. Usefulness. When I'm caught up in me and what I want and how I'm going to get what I want, I don't serve a purpose. We're in a selfie society now. It's more me and let me get these big lights so you can talk about me. I can do a reel of me. But when I'm thinking about you, So the feeling of uselessness and self-pity, I don't have time to tell you how my tooth got knocked out. I don't have time to tell you all the horrors that brought me in because in that moment, I just want to let you know it's going to be okay. I was like, we're not that bad. You know what I mean? We're not that bad. I will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in my fellows. So when I was four and a half months sober, I was in sober living and I went still with the band and they took us to this meeting and this guy was sharing, this Asian guy, I've never seen him again. But if I saw him, I wouldn't know because I didn't pay that much attention. I thought he was boring. And, uh, you know, but because I came from like this story of the stuff. And so if you didn't have like, you know, 17 policemen holding you up, I was like, I don't even hear you, right? And so he, so that's not the case now, but it was the case at four months. And um, so he was talking, and I was like, in my head, boring. And then he got to the end of his talk, and he said, I'm going to close my talk with the St. Francis prayer on page 99 of the 12 and 12. And he started to read the prayer, Lord, make me a channel of thy peace. When he started reading the prayer, I started crying. I didn't even think I was listening to him. And so this is why it's not about whether or not I feel like it. This is a program of action. I was where I was supposed to be because that prayer produced a spiritual experience for me. That prayer was everything I wasn't and everything I desired to be. That prayer is the opposite of self. Where there's hatred, let me bring love. Where there's doubt, let me bring faith. Right? And so um, when I came back to the rehab, I asked the weekend manager if she could open the office so that I could Xerox the copy, a copy of that prayer for every woman in the house because I thought they had been as moved as I had been. They had not. (laughs) They had not been moved. They missed the moment. But the spiritual experience is that I wanted to share with them. I don't give you anything. What's yours is mine, what's mine is mine. And any future earnings are mine. And so this beautiful thing, because I come from a place of if I give you some, it's not going to be enough left for me. And in that moment, I just wanted to share. That's a spiritual experience where you see, feel, and think differently than you did just a second ago. Right? And so it says, my whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. I understand that service is why I was created, to be of maximum service to spirit, which is what I call my higher power, and my fellows. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave me. Tricky. That is a tricky statement. Tricky, tricky, tricky. Because my car, the engine is tripping, and it is going to cost me some money, and I am a small business owner, and it's a problem. So it doesn't mean I will never have any fear around it. It means I won't rob you to take care of my business. I won't swindle you to get what I need done. I won't hook up in a relationship because I know they have some money. That's what it means. 
And I'm not afraid of you because I'm not afraid of me. I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. I'm willing to allow you to be human. I'm willing to allow you to make some mistakes because you've allowed me that. And so I intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle me. That's pause, right? I invite spirit in. I base everything I do on principles. Is this in alignment with my values, my spiritual values? And suddenly I realize the spirit has been doing for me what I didn't even think possible. You know, when I was little, my grandmother raised me. She loved me and I loved her and she was everything. And in her love, I felt safe and I felt secure and I just never wanted to be without her. I loved her, and I hope you have someone who, whom you feel that type of love for. I was terrified of the dark at night. I was little, you know? And because of all the stuff that had been going on in my family, I knew more than a child should know about anything, right? And so when I have a safe person, I want to be where that person is. And so at night, when I slept next to her, she would inhale, I would inhale. She would exhale, I would exhale. I told myself that if she died and we were breathing at the same rate, I would go with her. Because I couldn't imagine being on the planet without her. That's the depth of love I had for my grandmother. My mom had me at 17 so she's 16 pregnant. She did not have a proper support system. She was not emotionally, mentally equipped to raise a child in a healthy fashion. She just wasn't. My mom has really big boobs. And so the manner, and I'm not just giving you that to say, boom, you know what I mean? I'm sharing that with you because she packed her pistol in her bosom. And so the manner in which she would communicate is... If she found something you did to be disagreeable, the pistol would come out. And so I don't know how she graded the level of offense. <laughs> I just know that the responses fell into one of three categories. She would either hit you with the butt of the gun, she would shoot at you, or she would shoot you, right? So uh, sidebar, fun fact. So my dad and I were talking. My dad was a pimp for a lot. I'm sorry. Sunday morning spirit speaker. Manager. <laughs> my dad was a manager for many years. And he managed many women. And so, uh, so my, my dad and my mom broke up when I was really little, right? And they were so hardcore violent. And uh, <laughs> so I was talking to my dad, and he's like, I broke up. I left your mama because she was crazy. And he said, she shot me. And I said, because now I know the story, and I was like, eh, she did, but in all fairness, you did crack her skull with an RC bottle. You know what I mean? It's like, it's all in the details. You got to be willing to dig. And so... Um, <laughs> And so my mom was super violent. Now, I remember my grandmother, when I was nine, her parenting, I feel like it changed. Exactly. Hmm. Yeah. She started saying things like, if you're going to lay down, get paid for it. Exactly. I was nine. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to use the word, I don't know, inappropriate, right? And so... So here's the thing, because you remember when I started off and I talked about safe, when you have that safe person, when and we were talking about, I do work outside of this, right? I do trauma work outside of this. There's a workbook and there's all this stuff that I do. And so we talk about loyalty and how we form these beliefs. When I am loyal to you, I don't question anything you say. I am nine. I don't even understand what she is saying, but because I love her and because I feel she loves me, I know that whatever she's telling me must be for my own good. So when I look back, the messaging I received from my grandmother is, look cute and have someone else pick up your tab. The messaging I received from my mom is, if you want to be respected, you must be bigger and make yourself huge. You must demand respect. And so I come into Alcoholics Anonymous with this and so many other beliefs that I've not examined. I come into Alcoholics Anonymous with all this luggage. No, I was homeless. Garbage bags. <laughs> and what you do, this is the unpacking process. The first couple of bags we look at, and you're like, Candace, is this even your stuff? And I'm like, what? Huh? What's that even my 
messed up. I've been dragging this around for years. It's not even my stuff. Candace, are you willing to let it go? It's not even my stuff. Take it. (laughs) Then we start going through the other bags, and so it gets a little bit more dicey, right? So we're picking it up, and you're like, Candace, this behavior is too small for you, honey. Are you willing to let it go? I say yes. We pick up the other stuff, so now the question is different. This is torn. So can we mend this, or are we going to let it go? Can we mend this behavior? Can we mend this relationship? Or do we need to remove it, right? The inventory process, resentment, fear, sex, inventory, right? And so when I'm little, I remember when I started drinking, you know, I'm in junior high. My friends are drinking and having a good time, and I want to have a good time, too. It was super simple in the beginning. I'm not thinking I'm going to hit bottom, live on the streets, and come to AA toothless. I mean, who signs up for that, right? (laughs) Right? And here's the thing, alcoholism lives in arrogance. Even if you would have told me that this would befall me, I would have said, well, (laughs) I mean, you're obviously a bit more basic than I am. Perhaps you may have this experience, but I can assure you. You know what I mean? It's a lot of that. And uh, it lives in arrogance. It lives in my case is different. It lives in I'm the exception to the rule. It lives in I know it happened to the other 89 people that came before me. But number nine, zero, honey, that's it. That's the ticket. I'm going to change the game. Some people die trying to do that. Jails, institutions, and deaths, yeah? So I start drinking, and it's everything. I start drinking, and what alcohol did for me as it was going down, it, it smoothed the jagged edges within my spirit, within my womb. It filled me up. You know, my sponsor, Gloria Decker, she's gone now. I love Gloria. She was everything. She was the epitome of what an alcoholic, sober woman is. And Gloria, she would tell me, Candace, you cannot stop trying to fill a God-sized hole with man-made things, which is step six, right? Defects of character, a natural instinct that far exceeds its intended purpose. And so I'm drinking, and it's everything. I didn't know I was hurting until I started drinking, and it took it away. And so what that means is I have been hurting for years in my young life. I was 13 when I started drinking. But the minute I drank, it changed my perception of me, of you, and of everything I thought. But what I realized is that I was no longer hurting. That's when I realized, oh, I was hurting. So I had made peace with pain. I had accepted that I was just going to hurt. That's horrible. I was 13. And so as I start drinking, because the illness of alcoholism is progressive in nature, I start doing things that I didn't sign up for that previous to drinking, I would have told you absolutely not. I would never do this. My alcoholic life becomes the only normal one, right? I'm unable to differentiate the truth from the false because I'm making decisions based on self. Because I lack discernment, my, my thinking is skewed. I operate from those strange mental blank spots. And so I remember, you know, at this point I had started going in and out of foster homes. And uh, sometimes I would be on the streets of Hollywood as a teenage runaway. And so, you know, when you're a young girl, unprotected, things happen. But those things had already happened before I even started running away. So it's just an extension. It's just more of. But good thing I got alcohol, yeah? Funny thing is I do um, workshops. I do workshops professionally, non-AA related, but I do a lot of workshops in Alcoholics Anonymous. And one of them is called Conversations with the Bottle. It's a step one workshop. And so I'll give you an example. So I I am, I'm so sorry I missed all the other speakers. I am a huge, huge member of H&I, and I have been since I was six months over. I've always had panels. I had one panel for 17 and a half years, my other two panels for 13 years, and now I've had panels for like seven and eight years, respectively, when I moved um, back to West Hollywood. And so anyway, I remember, um, oh, I was going to tell you something. Well, it's gone. Yeah, it'll come back. (laughs) Moving on. (laughs) I was like, it was connected to that moment. If you don't grab it, it's over, right? If it comes back, I'll share it with you. If not, know that it was brilliant. So, (laughs) 
works. I was. What happened? Oh, thank you. Yes. Thank you. That you said what was family. Thank you. So, uh, okay. So I, I take panels into jails and prisons. That's where we were going with it. And uh, cause I am a member of H and I. And, um, so anyway, I was doing this, this conversations with the bottle panel. And so I usually get like 10 volunteers cause they, I got like 80 girls in there. Right. And they trust me. You go into jail and if you are talking to them honestly, they trust you and they want to be a part, but you don't have to get them to stop talking. They don't want to miss anything. So I asked for 10 volunteers, hands are going up and I said, okay, so everyone is facing each other, right? What's your name? I love Lori. I'm sorry, Mr. Lori. So if Lori and I are facing each other, Lori is the bottle and I'm leaving Lori. Right. This is conversations with the bottle. And so I'm going to start off and I'm going to tell Lori, the bottle, all the reasons why I'm leaving. I got, you know, no, I'm living without my tooth and I'm on homeless. I'm in a bush. You know what I mean? People trying to kill me. You're the reason. And so then Lori's goal is to get, get me to stay in the relationship. Lori doesn't want the relationship to be over ever. And so Lori's going to tell me all the reasons why I need her. I'm going to say I'm leaving. She's going to say, but you said that before. I'm not coming back, but you said that before. What are you going to do when your family turns on you? You know I'll be here. So I'm listening to, so we go down, right? And I mean, it gets like real because the bottle is desperate to keep you, desperate to keep you. And um, so this woman had just gotten her sentence. She was the last person. And she said, I just got sentenced to 25 years to life. She'd been telling the bottle why she was leaving. And so she ended with that. And so the bottle, the woman who was doing the bottle didn't know what to say. So I stepped in and I'm going to be the bottle. I said, if you're doing 25 to life, you're going to need me every day or it's going to be long. And she said, no, they told me they have meetings in prison. They told me I could start a meeting of my own in prison. They told me that I could have a pen pal who's a member of Alka. She started like, come and come and come and I was like, yes, 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 right? You know what I mean? Because here's the thing. I did this same panel in my other, the same workshop in my other panel, a women's shelter, right, last Monday. And so it got to a point. And so the bottle, oh, the bottle was brilliant. And the bottle is brilliant, right? Devious. And so the bottle's like, well, who's my competition? And the woman who was leaving the bottle didn't say anything. I jumped up. I was like, what? You have to always know. Because I said, tell the bottle what you're going to do to not go back to it. It's not about saying why I'm leaving, right? It's not about what it used to be like, what it used to be like, what it used to be like, what it used to be like. What happened to bring me here and what am I doing so that I don't go back on the days that it's hard? Because life on life's terms will make you want to drink. Life on life's terms can be painful, frightening. And you know that if you pick this bottle up, you know it doesn't mean you any good, but you're like, maybe this time it'll be different. Maybe you'll really have my back like you told me you have my back. And when the bottle asked me, asked her who was my competition, she didn't say anything. I said, tell the bottle AA and it's more than that. That's what the book says. Have you a sufficient substitute? Yes. Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's vastly more than that. There is no way that I could drink like I drank. Do all the things that caused me the shame that I, even if I wanted to stop the antics, the shame that hangs to me because of how I used to drink. I know that the bottle will take it away even if it's only for five minutes. And sometimes I just need five minutes. Your competition, Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's vastly more than that. And so I'm drinking and I'm doing my thing. I was living with my godmother and she had uh, purchased a Mercedes and she had her car for about six months. She was leaving to attend the Black Caucus Conference in Washington and she was going to be away for a week and she parked her car in her driveway and took the keys and placed them in her candy, in the candy dish in her home and took a shuttle and and before she left, she said something. I mean, I want to share it with you, but it's foggy. It sounded like, oh, let me reach back into the reservoir. Something like, 
don't touch my car. I don't know. I can't really be sure. And so now here's the thing. I just want to share this with you. If such thing were uttered, and I'm not saying it was, but if it were, eh, I felt like she didn't really mean it, right? Because that's how I live. (laughs) I live on a sliding scale. When you say something, I feel there's some wiggle room. But when I say something, it is law. Get clear, right? Yeah, because I want us to be friends, you know. And so, uh, so of course, I'm going to take the car. Duh. I'm going to a club in West Hollywood that night called the Whiskey. I think we all can agree that there is no better way to pull up to a club than in a brand new Mercedes, right? And so I'm driving the car that day just to get like in the zone, you know what I mean? And uh, I'm, I'm in, you know, how self will be featured, how self will debut. And as I'm driving the car consumed with self, I run into someone else's car. Whoops. I stood at the turning point, right? Yeah. So my hat's off to the person who has a valid driver's license and insurance. It was not happening for me. But details. I mean, who can be bogged down with details? when you're going to a club, I mean, seriously. And so, so unpleasant. And uh, now we're in a pandemic, and so finally people have understood the need to give individuals personal space. Why does it take a pandemic for us to do that? So I have always believed in the personal bubble, period. And, uh, and when people talk to me and they're right here, s- secretly I'm thinking, what did you not get as a child? Do you know what I mean? Why are you here? Move. And so, uh, so the guy whose car I hit did not understand the personal bubble. And um, his energy was so hostile. He was a negative Nelly. I did not like it. And, um, and I remember he was really demanding. I mean, it was just like he was bringing me down. And, you know, I mean, I need to be in the right frame of mind because I'm going to the club later. And uh, this whole car scene, you know, so his car is just like hideous, probably total, you know. And her car has a permanent grin, and he's demanding something in the way of paperwork. I don't know, not my car, I don't have a license. So I decide that um, he's ruining my cheat, and I need to go. And that's what I did, like I just left, because that's who I am, and that's how I live. And when I got back, so I guess it was like a hit and run now that I think about it. Huh. Anyway, so uh, when I got back, you know, you just like never put two and two together until this moment. I should be Sunday more often. So uh, so anyway, I uh, placed the, I drive the car back. I put the keys in the candy dish. I go upstairs and call my friend, tell her we're going to take a cab, you know, because the car is obviously out. And I made a commitment. I also had an inkling of a notion that when my godmother returned, I probably wouldn't be going out to any more clubs for a while. So she got back super upset, super intense with the whole car thing, like peeved. And uh, she had seen this movie called Tough Love, and I've never seen it, don't want to see it. But she saw it and was inspired and drew up a contract of things I was expected to do for having wrecked her car. And I remember reading off, she was like reading off all this stuff and things like, you know, volunteer your time and give of yourself to some charitable organization. I thought, ooh, what an order. I can't go through with it, right? (laughs) And so, um, because at that time, what's a way of life now was just unfathomable. How was that going to make my life better? And she is upset. What she, she was actually hurt. I betrayed her trust. People like us, you know the words we hear often? I trusted you. People are always saying that to us. I trusted you. And so I don't have any means to have her car repaired. And I'll tell you something, when you're holding me accountable and I'm not ready to be held accountable, I have to switch it in my head. I go to my happy place, right? I come out delusional. (laughs) And so now I get pissed because I'm like, you have insurance. Why are you coming down on me? As if I'm justified. So when I'm living in untreated alcoholism, drunk or sober, There is no column four. I live in columns one and two. Who you are and what you did to piss me off. 
I can't venture into three because three is uncomfortable. How does this, this affect my self-esteem, my personal relations, my sex relations, my ambition, my security, my pocketbook, my pride? Column four, where have I been selfish, self-seeking, dishonest, and frightened? Ouch. Ouch. She trusted me in and out of foster homes. She gave me my stepmother was incredibly accomplished. A graduate from one of the top universities in the country, former journalist, started her own company. Brings me, she's not prepared to have someone like me coming from the background I come from into her world. I come with a lot of stuff. I'm on the streets, there's foster homes, there's stuff that got, went on in the house when I was with my, you know what I mean? And so there is a sense of entitlement there. You, you have, it looks like you have money, whether she does or not, we don't really know and don't really care. You have this and I want it and I'm just going to take it. No type of responsibility. What if this guy had been injured? So I remember, you know, um, eventually moving out and having roommates and always having, you know, fights and arguments and we're all drinking. And so I started working for a record label. And when I started working at the label, um, they hired me as a receptionist. But, 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 hmm. You know what really resonates with me? CEO. Yes, thank you. Right? And so I knew that it was just a technicality. It was a glitch. They were going to work it out. And so, uh, and I remember, you know, my friends would call me delusional and I would say, I think the word you're looking for is visionary. And, uh, and so when I began to get promoted, was a short while, so I'm young, 21, right? So I get promoted, I'm working in promotions, a different industry. There was no social media. You couldn't do antics and then be in that industry or be like it just wasn't happening. It was a super exclusive world and I felt very common so I needed that. I didn't understand that I had low self-esteem. Everything is in hindsight. And so when you have low self-esteem, you need the external to make you okay, to validate who you are. So my whole image was everything to me. My self-esteem by association, I call it. I work for this label, I represent these artists, I live in this area, I date this person. I felt unworthy and entitled at the same time. My grandmother died and by the time I found out she had already been buried. She was my everything. But in the latter years, because I was so busy immersing myself in that world, I don't want to think about where I came from. I don't want to think about the truth of my childhood. I've already colored it, and I don't want to have to face that because it's, it's so contradictory. I can't reconcile. I don't have the tools to reconcile. It's too painful. My check engine light was on. <laughs> just have to know the whole car thing is going on. I can't get into it. It'll bring me down. So uh, don't ignore it. Yeah, It's like a thing, apparently, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, it'll go off. <laughs> then the car starts sputtering. Oh, my God. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> yeah, well. So, so my grandmother dies. I look around my stuff. Look around at my stuff. My stuff's not enough. What do you do? What do you do? <laughs> Get away from me. She said, drink. <laughs> True. But you're a bad influence. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so, stuff is not enough. The stuff was everything. You know, the stuff was everything. Alcoholism lives in lack, limitation. You're not going to make the grade. The rug is going to be pulled out from underneath you at any moment. That's why I need the members of Alcoholics Anonymous who have come here, who have taken all 12 steps. I'm taught that I'm a newcomer until I take all 12 steps. So if I'm sitting here for eight years without benefit of all 12 steps, I'm still new. I can't have a spiritual awakening as a result of anything if I haven't done anything. It's not possible. You have different types of speakers. Leslie's like the gentle, ooh, and I'm like, nope. <laughs> We're just going to get some balance, right? Because my life is on the line. If you tell me to, like, you know, meeting makers make it, make it to where? 
to their house with a gun in their mouth because they don't have the steps? What are you talking about? Meetings are absolutely crucial. Consistency is what we're talking about. But what do I do when I leave the meetings? It's great, come here, maybe the speaker's entertaining, hopefully, you know what I mean? But how is my story going to change your life if you don't do the internal work? I'm peaceful. I'm good. I understand what's happened in my life. I've made peace with it. I have a sense of purpose and direction. But what are you going to do? Because if, if we have friends here who have been in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, the inability to surrender, I feel for you. I have hit bottoms. I, because I have only had one sobriety date, I have hit bottoms, but they've been here with you. Super public, super embarrassing. If you are not prepared to look bad, you can't stay here. If you think you're going to come here living the way you used to live and then it's just going to get it all right all the time, it's not going to happen. Let yourself off the hook. We love you. We've been there. We don't want you to be there. But if you want to stay, then let me know when you're done. I don't beg people to save their life. It says under the lash of alcoholism, I'm driven to AA, under the lash. That means I am being beaten. I'm in an abusive relationship. It's not a partnership. Alcoholism is not asking me what I want to do. It's saying this is what we're going to do. And I'm going to say, but it's, I'm scared. It's going to take my dignity. It's like, you don't need your dignity. Come on. And I'm like, you're right. I don't need it. <laughs> I don't need that tooth. Is that crazy? I shudder at the thought, you know what I mean? <laughs> but it was par for the chorus. <sighs> Anywho, so I was looking at my stuff, it's not enough, and that's frightening, and I made a decision to, um, to just walk, uh, walk away from everything. And uh, I resigned. Literally, just I was non-degreed, and I had been given a great life, and they were loving me to death, you know? And so I walked in and just walked away from it all and, and really hurt some people and pissed some people off, made them look bad. And because they had dealt with all my shenanigans, me not showing up to work for like a week, two weeks, drunk, and just artists are dropping an album in New York. And I'm supposed to be in New York, but I'm drunk in L.A. You know what I mean? Like all of that. And so um, <laughs> that baby's like alcoholism. What? What? <laughs> Little kids are a trip. You're just like, okay, honey, just here, take a toy, take a toy. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I ran out of my money. Then I ran out of your money, which was heartbreaking. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I had to, like a moment of silence for that, right? <laughs> so I made a decision, and I made a decision to uh, market myself in exchange for a drink. I refer to that as the public relations phase of my development. And, uh, you know, the investors felt very good about the product, and they were willing to invest heavily. You know what old men love, young girls. And so I had a lot of clients all the time. And, um, and then here's what happened with the tooth. So I was staying up for like a lot of days in a row and I was drinking and enhancing my drinking. And uh, so as my looks declined, I would have to move areas, right? So let's say I was in a, a high-end real estate area. And then the people get really persnickety when you start, your looks start going. So I had relocated, it wasn't like horrible, but it wasn't great. And so I met this girl, really big girl, super cute face, super confident. And she was like, we should go work at the Bunny Ranch. And I was like, where is that? And she goes, Nevada, they make money at the Bunny Ranch. And I was like, yeah, yeah, let's go to the Bunny Ranch, right? Now, I want you to understand at this point in my life, my, my life is a three block radius. I'm not going to the Bunny Ranch unless you can bring Nevada to those three blocks. I refer to that as bar stool behavior. Bar stool behavior is when you sit on the bar stool and you say, tomorrow we're going to do this. Tomorrow I'm going to do that. T not today. Today I'm going to drink, but tomorrow. So I was like, okay, tomorrow we're going to go to the bunny ranch. And she said, well, we should work together then because we're going to be working our way across Nevada. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you understand what I mean. And so... I usually uh, am an entrepreneur by myself, and so I was like, okay, we can partner. We can partner. So we meet a guy, a client, I'll call him John, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> we negotiate terms and conditions, and uh, we go to this 
motel, sleazy, slimy, dirty motel, and we conduct business. He leaves, and, and she had said, my boyfriend just got out of jail, and he hits me. And I was like, well, you should leave him. And um, so about 10 minutes later, there's a knock at the door, and I'm like, who is that? She goes, it's probably my boyfriend. I'm like, how would he? He was on a bike. How would he know where we are? We drove, like, you know, several minutes. So they probably did this all the time looking back. So he comes in. So we're all there. and We're drinking and doing our thing. And they start fighting. And by they, I mean him. And uh, so he's hitting her. His fist in her skull. And she is crouched between the bed and the wall in the corner trying to protect her head. And I'm telling him, stop hitting her. You better stop hitting her. And I said, you better knock it off. And he did. He walked over to me, hit me one time. And my tooth blew across the room. And then he went back and continued beating her. And in that moment, they talk about moment of having a moment of clarity, like it's a, big, a, a good thing. I had a moment of clarity where I saw myself as I was. That's horrible. That's horrible. I'm not in AA. I don't have a sponsor. So you're just going to like give me me with no tools? How cruel. How cruel. And so... Uh, you know, my lips have always been beautiful and full for anyone listening to the, the CD. <laughs> I think luscious is a word we're looking for. And uh, so the night that this guy knocked my tooth out, my lips covered my whole face. My mouth was swollen. And I remember running over to the mirror, just a nasty, smelly little environment and I rinsed my mouth out and I looked in the mirror and I saw me as I was because I kept telling myself I could always go back into the industry I could always go back into my area I could always go back I could always go back and in that moment I realized this is my life a way of life is established by what you do repeatedly and in that moment I saw myself and I understood I was going to be there And I continued living my life. After he finished beating her, he came over. He was super apologetic, really remorseful. And he said, really sorry about that. But we can find it, and they could put it back in. I was like, ooh, a ray of hope. Really? So we all start looking for my tooth. They never found it. This is courtesy of a great dentist. And and I remember, you know, so I never saw her again until, actually, I got sober. And she came in the rehab, like... I was in sober living, and she came in, and she asked me to be her sponsor. She was in another relationship with another bad the guy who was beating her. And uh, I said, I got to talk to my sponsor first. And she was like, because you're my hero, and you you sober. That's what I want. I was like, really? Really? Okay, let me call my sponsor. And so my sponsor said, well, see if she's willing, and she wasn't. She didn't stay. She didn't stay. Of the people I got sober with in that rehab, I'm actually the only one that is still sober. Several of them are dead. And they were dead, like, shortly after they left. You know, so I was out on the streets and I don't take care of myself and I got pregnant. I'm not going to do anything to jeopardize the life of an unborn child. I'm never going to do that until I do it. And I'm never going to do this until I do it. And I'm never going to do that again until I do it again. That is what progressive looks like. That is what under the lash looks like. It is not a partnership. I find out I'm pregnant and I know how I'm living and I made a decision to terminate that pregnancy. It does not mean that I support termination and it doesn't mean that I don't. It's an outside issue. I'm never going to tell you where I stand on that. It it divides us. We can't handle that. I'm going to give you this information because it's relevant. When I was little, there were men who came into the home that I lived in with my grandmother, and they came in often, and they were fond of me in a way that is deeply inappropriate, often. And because of how I was living at that time, I couldn't guarantee that a child would be safe with me. It is for that reason that I made the decision to terminate the pregnancy, for that reason only. I couldn't risk what happened to me happening to it, my child. And I didn't think I would be able to prevent it. And so I made the decision to terminate the pregnancy, and I learned via every news station, radio station, TV station, that a member of my family had been arrested for raping, torturing, dismembering my 8-year-old little girl cousin. 
and the person who is responsible is my mom. So my mother has killed my two cousins, ages two and eight, same exact manner, because that's her signature, and a few adults, but we're going to talk about the kids. And as a result of that, she will spend her life in prison. And so when it happened, I'm on the streets, my mom is on the news, and it was just a bad deal, and I couldn't stop drinking. There were a lot of boxes, but not drinking was, I didn't see it on the list. I looked, it wasn't there. And so I remember continuing on as if I weren't pregnant. And the way I was living and people trying to kill me, it's interesting, people were trying to kill me like almost every day when I was drinking, and no one's tried to kill me when I'm sober. I think there's a correlation. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like the things that you're just like, huh. So months later when I went into labor, I had been up three days straight getting loaded. And I went into labor, and I was terrified. My hair was, I said, have long hair. My hair was matted. And I remember the nurses being very kind to me. They had to have seen women like me come in that hospital in that condition all the time. They had to have had a lot of emotions, because I can't imagine that some of these nurses weren't also mothers. But they were very kind to me, and I'll never forget it. When you are hurting, you always remember the people who are kind to you. And I remember being in that hospital, and they couldn't give me an epidural because I had so much stuff in my system already. And I was crying, and I was frightened, and I started praying. Now I want to pray. Please let my baby be okay. Please. And I remember 17 hours of labor giving birth to my daughter. You need to understand, this was not a pregnancy where her father and I, my daughter's a girl. <laughs> my daughter. Anyway, whatever. So... <laughs> Sunday morning, don't talk to me. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a lot happening right now. Uh, I have to deal with the car when I get back. It's still there, right? So, so I named my daughter Serenity because I looked at her and she was so beautiful and I felt so awful. I felt so ugly. I felt badly mangled. And I just wanted peace. I come from a world of hustlers. I come from a world of if you have the gift of gab and you say, this is what it is, this is what it is. You say, this is what we're doing, this is what we're doing. In Alcoholics Anonymous, you said, mm. shut your mouth, train your feet. I looked at my daughter. It wasn't like her dad and I were discussing baby names and colors of rooms. There was no safe place. And I didn't know who her dad was. And so I held my daughter and I cried and I remember I could feel her shaking. And I asked the nurse, why is she shaking? And she said, she's detoxing. You want to talk about shame? Lipstick can't fix that. There is nothing worse than looking pretty and feeling ugly. There's nothing worse than looking pretty and being envious of other people. I have sponsored some of the most beautiful women on the planet. But they are badly mangled. And so this process, this spiritual reconfiguration is made possible through all 12 steps. When I left that hospital, my daughter was three days old and did not come home with me. But I didn't think she would. You don't come home with a mother like me. At least you shouldn't, you know? And so by the time I got sober, because I wasn't done, now I have to drink even more because I got all this shame. And any time I'm in my right mind, it's so painful. What Alcoholics Anonymous does through the 12 steps and strong sponsorship, a strong sponsor is different than a sponsor who just says, call me whenever something's going on and get to a meeting when you can. I don't sponsor like that. I don't hang out with people who sponsor like that. I am sponsored. We have, an, we have a discussion when I ask someone to sponsor me and they share with me what the requirements are going to be. I'm going to ask you to go to several meetings. I'm going to ask you to get commitments at those meetings. I'm going to ask you to get to those meetings early. And if you're on Zoom, you need to not be in your bed. Your camera needs to be on. Why would you be in bed in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous? Why are you in your kitchen? Why am I seeing food shoveled in your mouth? Would you do that in an in-person meeting? Where's your respect? So the people who are sponsored by me, their cameras are on, they are not eating, they are never in their bed, they are in an appropriate setting. I'm asking you to save my life. I can't sit up? I just think that's crazy. 
And if you're one of those people, you're obviously not going to talk to me after the meeting. <laughs> but what do we have in common anyway? So it's fine. So, uh, so, uh, so we are, uh, so I, I get sober and a few months after that rehab had women with children and I would look at them longingly and I wanted my daughter. At this point, I didn't think I was going to stay sober. So, you know, it was like I stopped praying. She was almost two years old by the time I got sober. I didn't think I'd ever see her again. But now that I'm sober for like these four months and they have their babies and maybe you could help me. Maybe you could help me be different. Maybe you could help me do it differently. And I went to the director. I told her and she asked me, where was she? And I said, I don't know. She gave me a lot of numbers and they told me that uh, the last one said she had been adopted. They said, we have been trying to reach you, but you can't reach me when I'm on the streets. And so I never saw my daughter again. And when I turned five years old, I'd already gone through the steps and the traditions, which is what, what I do with the people I sponsor. We go through all 12 steps, all 12 traditions. And um, I started celebrating my daughter by gifting other mothers and daughters in her honor. Every year I would pray and every year I would be directed to do something different for a mother and a daughter. And I also have thrown full scale parties for mothers and daughters and gifts and all of that just depended on where I was at that time in my life. I sent a mother and her daughter to the spa one year when my daughter turned 21. Everything I wanted to do with my daughter's serenity, I did for someone else. You taught me that. That's how we erase shame, not by not talking about it, by saying, okay, what can I do that's useful? What can I do to help someone else since she's not here? I just wanted, if she ever found me, her not to be embarrassed and also to know I never forgot her. My daughter found me two years ago. <laughs> she was 25 years old, and uh, her name is still Serenity, and I met her mom, not her adopted mom, it's the only mom she's ever known, and her mother is just beautiful and amazing, and she's got other siblings, they're all adopted because she couldn't have children, and my daughter was raised in love, and she was never abused, and that's what I asked her. That was the third question I said, were you ever abused? She knew what I meant. She said, never. And she said, oh, by the way, you're a grandmother. And so, uh, yeah, I'm a grandmother. There is nothing like it. There is nothing on the planet like being a grandmother. I mean, I love my daughter. She's cool. But my grandbaby, <laughs> putting all my eggs in that basket. You know what I mean? And now she's four and she knows me. And so I'm just going to, I'm going to say this. You know, I love Alcoholics Anonymous and, uh, you know, anything I said about Zoom, only because I meant it. And, uh, <laughs> but I'll tell you this, you know, you want someone like me and you're like, ooh, quick story. And I'm like, totally shut up. Okay. So, you know, I've had the privilege of going to a lot of places in Alcoholics Anonymous since I was four and a half years sober, right? And uh, I remember, and I think I was 11, I was to speak at a conference in Winnipeg. Now, by the time I get to Winnipeg, I've been other places, like a lot of other places out of the country. And But Winnipeg, huh. So I go into Winnipeg. I'm flying all night. I had long braids. I had shades on and flip-flops. It was like a winter storm, but I had like flip-flops. These like really cute, like white top, pink pants. I totally remember it. And uh, so the guy was asking me questions at customs, and I felt like he was giving me attitude, but I was like, you know what? I'm really tired. I'm sure it's me, not him. And so he was just, he goes, do you have a, do you have a visual condition? I said, no, why? He goes, because you're wearing shades. So I took my shades off. I'm like, here you go. And so he, so he was like, have you ever been to jail? Hmm. So the answer is yes. And so I said, no. <laughs> you know, again, I think I was 11 or 12, and, I, and when you're ever filling out like an application or a resume, they say in the past 7 to 10 years. So I just applied that to that conversation. <laughs> he asked me again. I said, so I knew I probably, and I was like, but when you lie, double down. I said, nope. And um, he said, okay, I'll be right back. He came over with his supervisor. She wants to know, have I ever been to jail? I totally know I need to say yes. So I said, I have not. And um, she excused herself, came back with two sheets of paper, holds them up, and she said, 
so this isn't you. And I was like, oh, you mean those arrests, right? <laughs> they didn't want to let me in Canada. And I said, but I've spoken in Canada before, Ontario, when, you know what I mean, um, Toronto, I mean, you name it, I've been there. And they said, well, we're a smaller airport, apparently. We, it's like meddling. We have time to really delve into your life. And so, <laughs> so I, in that moment, said this. The woman on that sheet of, those sheets of paper, you don't want her in your life. She doesn't respect anyone. She doesn't honor tradition. You can't trust her. But the woman standing before you, I'm an active, sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm an invited guest here to speak at an AA conference. You've also given me special clearance to go into a women's jail to talk to them while I'm here. Someone like me, you absolutely want in your community and in your country. And so she went and spoke to her boss. And after a few minutes, she came back and said, welcome to Winnipeg. Yeah, You understand? My past is always going to be my past. My daughter, three months after we met, called me up. We talk all the time, but she said, I was thinking about you. I love that. And she said, you should do something like a motivational calendar. She knows who I am. I made a formal amends to her. She knows everything. But because of who I have become with you, she thought I should do a motivational calendar. And I thought it was cute. I have a workbook that I publish. That's what I do. I do trauma work, right, with individuals and groups. But because of her, two months later, spirit said, do the motivational calendar, my higher power. I said, I can't. It said, start here. So I published the Serenity 2021 calendar. I published the Serenity 2022 calendar. It was sold in Holland, in Australia, in L.A., in Michigan. You know what I mean? You did that. You took me from alleys. And you made me into someone who does motivational calendars. Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for my life. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.